Glad to see you today for our lectionary study. Uh, the texts uh, for today are for the sixth Sunday after Pentecost in year A, which happens to be now 2020. And so I would like to, uh, to start our text. As you remember the last time that we were together, that uh, Isaac needed to uh, get a wife. Um, for uh, for uh, to continue the line, of course, of the Hebrew people. So he did that, and uh, his wife's name was Rebecca, and she was a kinsperson of his, and he brings her back to um, to the uh, the place where. Uh, he lived, and so here we have a completely new story. Uh, our story for today comes from Genesis 25, and it is the beginning of the stories about uh, Jacob. And uh, Jacob was quite the wily uh, character. Uh, he was uh, one of those people that was, uh, I guess you could say a little bit like Robin Hood, because even though he did some things that might be questionable, he also did them uh, for a good reason and following along in uh, God's plan. And so we begin uh, the text with uh, uh, verse 19 of chapter 25. It said, these are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. So we have Abraham, we have Isaac, and soon we will have Jacob. Uh, Abraham was the father of Isaac and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebecca and then it gives her pedigree basically she's the daughter of the fuel uh, of uh, Aramian uh, Padan Aram she's the sister of Laban uh, the Aramean and so uh, we find out that we need a miracle Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And you will remember uh, in the story that Sarah was also barren. And uh, before she gave birth to Isaac, uh, the Lord had given her a child when she was 90 years old. And all this is predicated on the fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abraham that he would make a mighty nation of his and his descendants would be like the stars in the sky or like the grains of sand on the seashore. And the only problem with the promise was that not only did Abraham not have many, many descendants at the time that the promise was given, he didn't even have one descendant, one son, to carry out this promise that Yahweh had made to him. And so we have this story that continues. And so uh, Isaac, who wants a child, but his wife is also barren, prayed for uh, his wife because she was barren. And God granted his prayer and uh, his wife, Rebecca, conceived. And so by a miracle of God, this crisis of barrenness was overcome. And so the line of the family can and will continue. At least we know this from this part of uh, the story. Now, the next thing that happens in the story is to tell us about Rebecca's pregnancy which is really very problematic. Uh, my father was a physician and he said, sometimes when everything's hitting on all cylinders, a woman who is pregnant will be at her healthiest optimum for her whole life. Now, maybe the women that were pregnant would have disagreed with my father about that, but as a physician, that's what he thought. And so uh, I always remembered that he had said that. For Rebecca, however, that was definitely not true. It says that the children struggled within her. That is, it looked like she was going to have twins. And she said, 
if this is the way, uh, if this is to be the way, why do I live? Which is a Semitic way of saying, why have you done this to me? Or what is life worth living when I'm in this kind of pain and turmoil? She probably couldn't sleep. It was probably hot where she lived in the ancient Near East. She was in a state of total misery. Uh, and so she went and inquired of the Lord. In other words, that's another way to say that she prayed to God, give me respite from this problem pregnancy. And the Lord said to her, and this is the reason why there's this struggle in her womb. Two nations are in your womb. The two peoples born of you shall be divided. There will be a division between them. The one shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. The elder shall serve the younger. In other words, the younger one will be uh, have primary authority over the older one. And this violates the ancient Near East law of primogenitor, which basically means that it is always the eldest son that is in the privileged position. Uh, when the will comes out at the end of the parent's life, uh, the eldest son will receive two thirds of the property and the other sons will divide the last third. And so here, God's answer to Rebecca's prayer is to explain to her that the two children in her womb, the twins that are fighting, represent two different nations. And that eventually, when uh, they grow up, it is the elder which will serve the younger, which goes against all principles of family life in the ancient Near East. Uh, when the time to give birth was at hand, uh, there were twins in her womb. And uh, the first came out red and his body like a hairy mantle, and they called him Esau. Uh, some scholars say that Esau is a name that represents Edom, which was a country that uh, red symbolized, and that uh, he was uh, a hairy, manly type of man. And then it said afterwards, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob, and Jacob means supplanter. Uh, one of my Old Testament professors, when uh, I was at Perkins years ago, used to tell this story, and he would call Esau Harry, he would call Jacob Grabby. Uh, Esau, because he had this hairy mantle of red hair all about him, and uh, he was an outdoorsman. He hunted, and he fished, he took field and stream and so forth. And uh, Jacob was quiet and gentle and lived in the tents. And so you get sort of a feminine taint to uh, Jacob in this early part of Jacob's story, but he will be anything but that. He will become the wily conniver who knows how to trick the tricksters. So Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. And so here you go. Daddy is 60, which is, I guess, better than having a daddy who is 100 years old, uh, like Isaac had. Uh, when the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. So uh, here, the next sentence in the text gives us all the reasons in the world to be careful of our parenting because we had two parents here who sowed the seeds of dissension for their children from that point on. It said Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And so this is always a problem, I suppose, when parents show favoritism to one child or another, and that's what happened. Now, the first story of conflict that we will see between Jacob and Esau begins at verse number uh, 29 in our text. 
It said, once when Jacob was cooking a stew, he was quite the cook. He was always in the kitchen, uh, just getting something together for people to eat. Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Uh, in other words, he was a very, very hungry person. And uh, this will, this little story here that we have will, uh, will show you um, sort of the personalities of each one of these. Uh, Jacob measured a cook, looking at the recipe, fixing some stew, and uh, his brother Esau comes in from the field. He may have been out for several days hunting game, trying to find something uh, for the family to eat. Esau said to Jacob, uh, Harry said to Grabby, let me eat some of that red stuff for I am famished. And that red stuff, the stew, that's a play on the word Edom. And that's why it's in the text. Therefore, he was called Edom. Jacob said, first, sell me your birthright. Now, there are two kinds of, uh, of gifts that a father bestows on his children. One is a, uh, a blessing and one is a birthright. They're different to a degree, but they both show the favor of the father towards that particular child, which in this case would be a boy. And Jacob knew that. And as a tricky, wily, conniving sort of fella, he knew that his brother was very, very hungry. He knew that his brother was very impetuous. And so uh, Esau comes in and sort of in gutturals, like almost like a caveman, he asks his brother, give me some of that red stuff. And then Jacob replies, first sell me your birthright. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? In other words, He's taking the short view of things. He wants something that will satisfy him within minutes, whereas he is selling his whole future to his brother for basically a bowl of soup. Jacob said, swear to me first. And so he saw swore to Jacob and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil soup and he ate and he drank and he rose and went his way. Thus, Esau despised his birthright. Now down through the history of interpretation of the Christian scriptures, this Hebrew story has basically cast a poor light on Esau who doesn't even think, he just reacts, he just responds. There's no measure in his thinking. He's not being rational, he's being rash and he's being passionate because he wants something to eat and he wants it right now. Now later on, uh, this story will continue to spin and it will spin basically out of control. But the three takeaways from this particular text that I would like for us to, to ponder anyway is that First, there is another crisis of a woman being barren who is to bear the child that will continue the line of descendants from Abraham that will be able to fulfill the promise that Yahweh makes to Abraham in chapter 12. The second thing is that this gift of pregnancy in this particular case is freighted with trouble and with danger. We can see from the very beginning, there is a palaver between these two twins while they are in utero. And you can't really start a conflict much before that. And so that's the second thing to remember, that the gift of pregnancy uh, is fraught with uh, trouble and with danger. And the third thing is, that we move quickly from the time of their birth to the first instance of the conflict between the two twin boys, Jacob and Esau, or Esau and Jacob. Uh, that violates the law of primogenitor. Now, I would invite you, if you would, to uh, turn with me 
to uh, Psalm number 119. And you will notice in Psalm 119 that we have um, a few verses that uh, begin with 105. One of the things that you need to know about this particular text is that Psalm 119 is the longest psalm out of the 150 psalms that we have in our Psalter. Uh, it's, a, it's an unusual, there's a reason why it's so long, uh, and one of the reasons is that it is uh, what um, literary scholars call an acrostic alphabet poem or song. And what an acrostic is, is a piece of literature that is arranged in such a way as, so that people can more easily remember it. In the Hebrew Bible, there are 22 letters. And this psalm is made up of 22 stanzas of eight lines each and each of the eight lines begins the first, uh, the first eight verses of uh, Psalm 119 begin with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The next eight verses begin with the second uh, alphabetic uh, term for the Hebrews, and so on and so forth. Our lines here it, that begin at 105 are the lines of the uh, Hebrew character or uh, alphabetic character that is called Nun, N-U-N. And uh, it's, uh, it, it has uh, every one of its lines begins with Nun. It's eight lines. That's how many lines there are in the Hebrew. Uh, one of the problems with translating uh, Hebrew acrostic Psalms into English is that we lose the sense of that orderliness. Now, somebody might say, well, why in the world would Hebrews write a psalm in this very technical way that would be difficult to uh, compose in the first place? Well, the reason is it's a mnemonic device, which is a device that helps us uh, uh, remember things. Uh, we all have uh, mnemonic devices. A mnemonic device, for instance, about the alphabet is to sing that little song. I bet when I've had a dictionary in front of me, I, I've sung the ABCs hundreds and hundreds of times because it helps me remember the order of the letters so I can more easily find them in the dictionary. There's a, a lot of mnemonic devices that, uh, that we can remember. Um, there's one, and I did not look this up, but there's one to um, remember the order of the letters in, uh, in Roman numerals. All lucky cows drink milk. I, I don't remember what it is, but that's an example of a mnemonic uh, device. And so that's why this psalm is written this particular way. And uh, it's a very simple, straightforward song, the whole of uh, 119, uh, but especially the part that we have today. There's nothing uh, particularly exciting about it or revelatory. All it tells us is that this is an affirmation of God's Torah. If one lives by the words of the Torah, one will do well and prosper. If one does not, one will walk the evil path in darkness, and uh, that evil path in darkness will lead to a life of misery. This psalm, if you want to know the truth, is very similar in its content and in its focus to Psalm number one. And so if you get tired of reading Psalm 119, all the verses of it. Let's see, I can't remember, 176 verses. You don't want to read that many. Just turn back to Psalm 1. It's got many, many fewer verses, and it gives essentially the same uh, message that we have. It says, your word, and that could be uh, your Torah, is a lamp 
to my feet and a light to my path. In other words, if one follows the dictates, the commands, the ordinances of God, then one will have a light by which to walk. Uh, I have sworn an oath and confirmed it uh, to observe your righteous ordinances. In other words, uh, one who follows this uh, psalm, this person is uh, giving his oath that uh, he will follow these rules. Uh, then he says, I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. In other words, uh, God's word, Yahweh's Torah, is life giving to the person. Accept my offerings of praise, O Lord, and teach me uh, your ordinances. I hold my life in my hand continually, but I do not forget your law. Now, I hold my life in my hand continually. That is part of what Paul will be getting at uh, in our next session in Romans, which talks about the autonomy of a person. When we are left to our own devices and we make our own decisions, regardless of the counsel of other people, regardless of the ordinances, the Torah, the law of God, then we usually get in big trouble. The wicked have laid a snare for me, but I do not stray from your precepts. This is a kind of a confession of faith that the psalmist is saying, Lord, I follow what you have laid down for me. Your decrees are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. And so as you can see, there's not any earth-shattering uh, information here for people. It's just this person seems to acknowledge that God's law is just, upright, and righteous, and that he pledges his oath to follow that particular law so that he can be a person who walks the path which is in the light and not in the darkness. And we all know that when we walk where we can see, we usually function much better than stumbling around in the dark. I want to thank you for being with me today. And uh, my promise is extended to you. If you have any questions about any of the texts, just uh, uh, email the church office and we will do our best to come back with an answer for you. Thank you. Thank you.